I think we have more or less uh, almost everybody here now. Ian, if you like to start, uh, maybe most of us, we, or all of our speakers, they started by kind of self-introducing how they made their path, you know, to, it's very interesting to hear, you know, if you've reached this very, very uh, 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 challenging and, and very responsive, full of a responsibility position now in one of the world's greatest banks, and you're not a white European, so that is also, I think, quite a, an achievement because, uh, you know, women and the pe other people who are not, uh, 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 other minorities, you know, <laughs> who are <laughs> actually not really minorities, but uh, so that it's much, much harder to reach high levels than for, you know, blue-eyed white Europeans, at least in, in you know, certain uh, areas. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you, everyone. Good evening uh, from Asia. Good afternoon uh, to everyone in Europe. So like, I'll say at the outset, I don't know how interesting this is going to be, um, but I will oh. do, do my best to make a banker's career path as interesting as possible. Um, and I guess if there was one overarching comment I'd make uh, at the outset, it would be uh, that you really can't plan uh, your career. And so, you know, I think Steve Jobs once said uh, at some uh, university, maybe it was the Harvard inaugural address, that when he looked back on uh, on his life, he was able to join the dots looking backwards. But at the time, there's no master plan as you're looking forwards. And I think that that's very much the case uh, for myself. So I'll spend, um, I think, Gerhard, you gave me kind of four questions to think about. So you know, I'll just outline what those questions are and then I'll ramble for a bit. And to the extent that anyone has uh, any questions, feel free to interrupt me along the way. Um, but, you know, a few minutes uh, to talk about my career path, uh, key decisions uh, that I took or were made for me and why, uh, then how, why I became an investment banker and perhaps uh, as importantly, why I've kept going. Uh, and the UHO will be uh, more familiar with that part of my story than anyone else since I worked for him uh, for a period of time. Um, interesting projects that I've worked on. Uh, obviously, I will give you kind of high level there, but I think there are some quite interesting lessons and uh, some things that I tell to my own colleagues as well. And then kind of big picture view, where are we in the world, where the world is going? Uh, what can we do about it? I think it's probably easier to uh, give an assessment as to where we are in the world, perhaps where it's going, what we can do about it. I think that collectively you guys are much more intelligent than me, so you'll have a better idea about that, but at least I will be able to ask the right questions. Um, so I will, uh, and if any of this gets boring because you don't want to hear about every aspect of my life, uh, then, you know, just kind of nudge me uh, and I will try and fast forward. Uh, but since maybe to start in reaction, Gerhard, to your uh, opening uh, welcome where you said neither am I female nor am I white, I should probably start by explaining where I've come from uh, and we can take it from there. So I was actually born and raised in the UK, as perhaps my accent will suggest. Uh, I'm half English uh, on my mother's side and then my father was actually born in Venezuela and raised in Trinidad before moving to the UK. And I come from the northwest of England from a county called uh, Cheshire. Uh, I went to uh, school in Manchester and then ultimately I was at the annex of Trinity called Trinity Hall next door. So I'm, I guess I'm an honorary guest for the purposes of this series. Um, so I am a linguist by background. Uh, I did uh, French, German, maths and a general paper for A-level. And it's kind of relevant because I thought that I was gonna to go to university to study French and German. Uh, and I applied to Trinity Hall to read French and German. Um, if you cast your minds back to 1989, the 4th of June, there was the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre. Uh, and a week after that, my father came home from work and he said, China's the future. You should do a gap year in China I've done a bit of research and I think you should apply to this particular university. It was called the University of International Business and Economics. Um, and if you also recall from 1989, it was the, you know, from a European perspective and perhaps juxt juxtaposed with uh, the, the uh, big uh, incident in China, we saw the fall of communism sweeping across Europe. And so 
for my 18th birthday present uh, as preparation for my interview for Trinity Hall. Uh, I took myself off to Berlin to see the wall come down, thinking that I would be uh, able to dazzle everyone with my initiative because I'd gone to Germany and I sat there at my interview uh, and um, they said to me, so please explain why the popular revolution failed in China and succeeded in, uh, in Eastern Europe. And I gave an answer because this is the sort of thing that you can never prepare for because you couldn't otherwise anticipate the question. I gave an answer and the professor looked at me and said, no, try again. Uh, and that was my introduction to Cambridge University. I tried again. And next time he said, better, let's continue. So, uh, you know, I kind of fast forward from there. I actually ended up going to China. I did a gap year uh, then. And during that year, I became very interested in Japanese literature. Um, I had a couple of friends who, uh, foreign friends as in non-Japanese, who were reading books about Japan. So as every gaijin, as every foreigner does, uh, I dabbled a little bit in uh, Mishima Yukio and Endo Shisaku. And as a result, I decided, uh, having visited Japan for a week during uh, that time, so this was Chinese New Year holiday in early 1991, I uh, decided that I wanted to study Japanese. So, you know, you kind of think back from 1989 to 1991, you get into study French and German, you do a gap year in China, then you, uh, you decide that you want to pursue studies in, in Japan. Uh, in Japanese. And so I came back from my gap year, I persuaded my parents that that would be the right thing to do. I re-interviewed when I uh, got to uh, Cambridge, and I embarked upon uh, four years of Japanese study. During that time, I was fortunate enough to win a national speaking competition. Uh, and that got me an internship at Toyota, in um, at, actually at their Tokyo headquarters in Sidobashi. Um, and that really was my first introduction to investment banking. So I was part of a division, it's called the International Public Affairs Division, that translated uh, the fiscal statements from Japanese into English and then explained them to the research analyst community. So I, I got to kind of understand a little bit about investment banking, albeit that it was the research part of uh, banking as opposed to corporate finance or investment banking, traditional investment banking that I ultimately went into. I was quite fortunate, um, as many of you will know from your time at, uh, at Cambridge, most courses in the UK are three years at university or undergrad, unless you're studying languages or if you're perhaps studying engineering as well. And that meant that I had the luxury in my third year of having no exams, having had a term out in Japan, coming back from Japan uh, with very little to do and watching all of my friends uh, faff around and you know go through the milk rounds and everything else and decide what they wanted to do for a career and it was pretty obvious to me pretty quickly uh, that um, you know the two things that looked most interesting to me were investment banking and management consulting so I kind of looked at my friends and saw where they applied where they succeeded where they failed uh, and then I applied to a few firms and I got accepted into a couple of those few uh, one of those was SBC Warburg so I was the first year the first intake of SBC Warburg of course uh, Yuchira who is on the screen was at SG Warburg which was the uh, you know the predecessor shall we say and so I uh, joined in September 1995 and I was very very keen to go to Japan as quickly as possible but I was advised by a number of people to get my training in the UK uh, and I was told that I should do a couple transactions in M&A, a couple transactions in equity, a couple transactions in debt. Uh, Yuichiro and I were actually in the same group working with uh, some old friends who worked us very, very hard at the time. Uh, so it was a little bit of a baptism of fire. Um, but I did work in London for three years. Uh, and then I moved uh, with SBC Warburg to Tokyo. So I moved in 1998. Um, so I ended up, and if you just kind of take a step back and look at the arc of my career, I was three years London, uh, 12 years Tokyo, 13 years now in Hong Kong, uh, always in investment banking. I've worked for three different firms, uh, SBC Warburg for five years, uh, Nico Solomon, which was a joint venture between Solomon Smith Barney and Nico Securities, 
that then became City. Uh, I was with them in Tokyo for six years, and then I joined Goldman Sachs in Tokyo in 2006. Uh, I've been with them ever since. I'm in my 17th year, uh, four years in Tokyo, and then the remainder in Hong Kong. But, you know, kind of going back to... um, to the start of my career as a linguist, to be to be totally frank, I found the initial couple of years quite challenging because I had to dust off the maths that I'd done earlier in my uh, A-level studies and learn how to uh, build financial models and all of that. And I found, you know, that was quite challenging, uh, at least for me at the start, but it was a fantastic training. And, you know, if I feel lucky about one thing um probably more than one thing but the training that i got at sbc warburg i genuinely believe is the best possible training i could have received anywhere um and uh you know we had a 20th zoom reunion uh, a couple of years ago all of my analyst class bar one person attended uh and a number of old friendships have been rekindled through that because we were in the uh, in the bullpen if you will for a couple of years, being uh, beaten up by all of our senior bankers, being pushed really, really hard. But that's how you learn. Uh, and certainly how I learned. Uh, and I think that the quality of the training, our ability to uh, understand uh, at that stage financial statements, but provided a very solid foundation, I think, upon which we were able to build uh, client coverage skills in due course. And so you know, I felt extremely grateful for that. Um, I was initially in Tokyo for a couple of years, and then the question kind of raises itself as a foreigner, uh, where can you add the most value? And therefore, where should you be? Should you stay in Japan? Should you go back to London? Should you try other geographies, New York, etc.? cetera? Um, I, I was asked that question. I wanted to stay in Japan, but I also realized that you know, again, as a foreigner in investment banking in Japan, you have to be able to add value to uh, your client base. And in that respect, um, I thought that the best thing I could do was to get as much transaction experience as possible. And so moving to Nico Solomon, which was essentially a joint venture with a Japanese securities company, um, you know, you're able to get exposed much more to kind of domestic banking culture, which may have not been at the time as sophisticated, if you will, relative to what I'd experienced in in uh, London. I got transaction velocity and volume and I was able to improve my Japanese as well. It was a fantastic experience. Um, was there, as I said, for six years. Um, And this is where you can't really predict the future. And so we now fast forward to 2003. um, And we had the first large scale corporate leverage buyout in Japan. So this was after uh, all of the non performing loan activity at the end of the 90s, early 2000s, the dot com crash. uh, And then we saw um, LBOs introduced in Japan as the foreign private equity funds came in. So I was at Nico Solomon at the time. And uh, there was a firm called Ripplewood that was buying Japan Telecom. um, And I was put on that deal because I was literally the only foreigner. And they said, you go and figure it out. And I, you know, I felt very much like a duck out of water. Uh, I had to understand uh, leverage buyouts very, very quickly and then work with our global team who covered uh, Ripplewood. And as hard as that was, um, I have to say that that really was the launch pad for my career as a senior banker, because the commercial side of what I I do since then, i.e. since 2003, which means that we're now in my 20th year, has been largely to do with private equity funds. Um, And so I continued, uh, you know, I worked on that deal, then worked on the sale of Japan Telecom to SoftBank, uh, then was asked to cover private equity formally as they were coming in. So this is the likes of uh, Bain Capital, KKR, Bearing Private Equity Asia, Advantage Partners, CVC, Warburg Pinker, so on and so forth. Uh, And so I did that for a couple of years, ended up working on a transaction with Goldman Sachs. Then uh, Goldman Sachs asked me if I might be interested in joining them to build out uh, financial sponsors uh, practice uh, in Japan. So after a lot of consideration, I decided to do that, moved over in November 2006, um, built a business through the financial crisis of 2008, 
uh, then was given the opportunity to move down to Hong Kong and to run that business on a Pan-Asian basis, uh, which I did from 2010. Uh, I still do that together with my uh, colleagues in the various uh, countries that constitute Asia Pacific. Um, and, you know, I got promoted to partner at Goldman Sachs in 2014. Uh, I took over all of client coverage in 2016. I became a co-chief operating officer for the banking division in 2018, co-head of the banking division in September 2020, and then sole head in July of 2022. And so, you know, I don't think that I could have planned this from someone who was from the north of England studying French and German and candidly didn't know where Asia was. I would never have been able to have guessed that, A, I would be... Uh, in in Asia for now, I think it's now 25 years uh, out of a almost 28 year career. Point two, you know, when I went into banking, I kind of thought that I'd do it for a couple of years, learn how to think logically, um, having been uh, enthralled by Japanese literature throughout my time at university. Uh, and then I would go and do something really fun and really cool and really interesting. So either um, I'm not a fun, cool or interesting person, or investment banking has become along the way fun, cool and interesting because 28 years later, I'm still doing the same thing. And so that I think leads to, you know, why I keep going doing this. And one of the things that I've, I've kind of realized about myself, um, you know, going back to my comments around how difficult I found it at the very start, you know, I had to learn a skill set. I had to learn uh, the nuts and bolts of corporate finance. Uh, but with that as a foundation, you know, I think all of us come to the various careers that we develop from different perspectives and with different skill sets, perhaps. And so, you know, the ability, of, this is one of the things that I, I think about when people ask me, what did I get out of Cambridge University? Actually, very simply, I learned how to think independently. Uh, that would be the, the simplest way of me putting it. Uh, I think I learned, therefore, very early on that, you know, even if you don't know the answer, you'll be able to find it out either on your own or because you know uh, who to ask to help you to get to the answer. And so I found that there was incredible variety in investment banking. And as I got a little bit more senior, I had the uh, opportunity to influence outcomes and to influence uh, clients. I could convince them, hopefully, to do something that I thought was in their interests. Um, I would say equally, and I'll kind of come on to this in terms of interesting projects, uh, convince them not to do something if I thought that that wasn't in their interests. Um, and, you know, the ability, uh, and maybe this speaks to my own insecurity, uh, but the ability to have an influence on, uh, on your clients to help them, whether it's in the context of raising capital, whether it's in the context of buying businesses that you think will uh, you know, that will accrue, if you will, to the value of their company and their stakeholders over time. I continue to find very, very interesting. I feel lucky that I work uh, for Goldman Sachs, which I think is uh, one of, if not the uh, best human capital management uh, investment banks uh, in the world. Um, and for as long as it remains interesting, then, you know, it's something that I want to continue doing. Um, you know, one of the things that we do at Goldman Sachs, just in terms of, you know, the broad remit of our jobs, of course, there's the day job where you're there to influence commercial outcomes and to drive the division. But we also are expected to fulfill a role in the community. Uh, so part of our compensation every year is um, what we call Goldman Sachs Gives, and that's a pool of capital that needs to be invested into charitable institutions. So, you know, we do some of that, which matters to me quite a lot. Uh, in my in my spare time, if you will, I've co-founded a couple of initiatives. One is called Get in Cambridge. Uh, and so this is something at Cambridge University, which has essentially been set up to democratise access um, to educational opportunity at Cambridge University by looking at the composition of the university uh, and mapping that against the composition of British society and seeing where there are gaps. Uh, and so underrepresented groups, we look to help underrepresented ethnic groups, we look to help. Um, and uh, we will, you know, you know, essentially will kind of show that there are people who look like them who have had the same opportunities and have thrived at, at Cambridge. And we also raise money to uh, 
to help them fund their passage through Cambridge, because of course there is a direct correlation uh, between one's uh, one's ethnicity in the UK and one's socioeconomic background for the most part. So that would be one thing I've done. Another thing I've done with going back to my uh, start in investment banking at SBC Warburg is coming out of our 20th anniversary Zoom reunion, uh, four of us uh, expressed our love of the arts on that Zoom call. And over the, uh, the, the two years post that uh, anniversary, we developed a new model um, for philanthropy in the arts, specifically to develop next generation uh, board membership in the UK arts. Um, and that uh, initiative is called REAC, Responsible Influence in Arts and Culture. It's specifically for UK arts, be that theatre, be it dance, be it museums, uh, be, it, um, be it opera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but essentially what we do is we try to attract young people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who have a passion for the arts, have a professional skill set that they've developed, uh, are interested in board membership, but don't quite know how to uh, investigate, how to explore that. We match them with uh, existing board members, some of the most esteemed uh, board members of the UK arts organisations in the UK. So we will pair them. They'll be mentored for a year and we'll put them onto the board of an arts organisation. So the arts organisation gets the benefit of uh, the best in terms of best in class existing board members mentoring the next generation. After a year, that union breaks because the people have been trained up and then they can go off and mentor more people and they will be able to populate more boards. And so, you know, I say all of that because I know that the life of a banker uh, sometimes can seem quite dull to the outside world. But I think that uh, the experience that I've got at Goldman Sachs, the profile that it's given me over the life of my investment banking career, and, you know, to be fair as well, the financial flexibility um, has been super helpful in, you know, at some level trying to give back to uh, causes that I believe in in the community and equally to, uh, to influence outcomes. Um, in terms of interesting projects, so I've mentioned one, which was the uh, leverage buyout of Japan Telecom, which I really enjoyed. I'm going to mention uh, a, couple, a couple more in no particular order. So the second one would be, um, and this is a lesson I think for all of our aspiring, whether it's bankers, uh, it could be whatever profession, you know, back in uh, 2010, so this was post financial crisis, uh, we were very, very vigilant around uh, expenses and travel and all of that stuff. And I had a client that asked me to uh, fly to New York to appear on a private equity panel uh, you know, I had to get special approval to do it. I didn't really, you know, I wasn't convinced at the time it was the best thing to do, but my client said, Ian, this would mean a lot to me. Uh, and I did it. And uh, I didn't hear anything for four years. Four years later, I got a call from this person. They said, Ian, I'm now president of uh, a new company and we're going to do great things. And I want you to be involved. Your competitors are all over us. You guys are not yet. Uh, but I'll give you a chance because you helped me four years ago when I needed you. Uh, and then if you fast forward from 2014 to 2022, this particular client has been one of the best clients of Goldman Sachs in the Asian Pacific region. And we've led every single transaction, some of which have been multi-billion dollar capital raises. And so, you know, you never know in life just by doing something to help someone that you may not think is a big deal to them may be a, a big deal. And that certainly has paid huge dividends uh, for me in my career. But again, it was completely unintended because at the start, this company was worth a few hundred uh, million dollars. Uh, it's now worth about $50 billion, but at its peak, it was worth $250 billion, uh, all in a very, very short space of time. Uh, the final two things I will mention, one is uh, one of my clients uh, was looking at buying a football club in the UK a few years ago. This is an American client. Um, uh, they said, Ian, what do you think? And I said, you shouldn't do it. This is a deal that you shouldn't do. Uh, I know that I'm probably, uh, you know, conning myself out of potential fees, but the UK is very tribal when it comes to its sport. Uh, and do you really want that level of scrutiny around yourself, your family, and everything else. 
And by the way, if they're not successful, this will be a massive capital sink for you. Uh, and then a couple uh, years later on my client's 50th birthday, I called him up and I said, you know, I know that most people will say happy birthday and look at all you've achieved. I'm here to remind you of the best decision you ever made was the deal that you didn't end up doing as opposed to the deal that you did. Uh, and the final thing I would say is, you know, three years ago, I uh, helped uh, together with a number of people at Goldman Sachs. We advised the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the HKMA, on its capital support for Cathay Pacific, because as you all know, the airline suffered uh, quite severely through the pandemic. And to be able to, to work on a transaction that was at the same time high profile, but uh, also was helping an airline and really helping Hong Kong, uh, I took you know very, very personally um, because you, you knew that you were making a difference to a number, and when I say a number, thousands of people's uh, livelihoods and also to uh, the future of uh, the airline in Hong Kong. So, you know, a little bit of an eclectic mix, but they were the things that kind of stand out to me and the reasons why uh, they stood out to me. And then the final thing I'll say, and then perhaps I, I should probably pause to see if there are um, any questions is, you know, kind of where are we in the world? Um, and I've given a fair amount of thought to this recently because, you know, I myself have been guilty of using the following phrase and I've kind of revised my, my views around it. But when you pick up The Economist, you pick up uh, any of the current affairs magazines, you kind of hear um, that we're in a period of deglobalization. And someone, uh, you know, they pulled me up on this recently and they said, are we really deglobalizing or is it that we were in a phase of hyperglobalization uh, through uh, the last 20, 30 years? if you will, since the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, we saw the Soviet Union open up. We saw uh, the EU expand. We saw NATO expand. We saw Ch China joining the uh, WTO and so on and so forth. And then there was more connectivity through the digital revolution as well. So that was the era of hyperglobalization, if you will. Right now, geopolitical tensions clearly have ratcheted up. You know uh, much better than me, given your proximity to what's going on uh, in the Ukraine and what's going on there between uh, with, with the Russian invasion, if you will. Uh, we also see geopolitics or political tensions between the US and China um, at uh, arguably an all time high as well. But, you know, as we think about all of that, we shouldn't lose sight of the economic interdependence. Uh, that is evident between these countries. And I read an article in uh, the Financial Times over the weekend that really brought this home to me, which said, you know, there is a cognitive dissonance, I think was the phrase that was used, um, between the state of geopolitical tension, diplomatic spats, and the fact that China and the US right now, uh, the, the kind of economic relationship, bilateral trade is something like $700 billion. Uh, and that's reached an all-time high. And so, you know, if that's not uh, an outcome of globalization, I don't know what is. And so I think that the world order is perhaps shifting. I don't believe that, that the world is deglobalizing, but I do think that it's realigning. And we're probably going to see coming out of all of this, if we were able to fast forward, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and look back, you know, there is part of me that wonders as China ascends as a superpower, you know, whether or not the US retains its status, uh, we are seeing uh, the emergence of other countries and other economies. You know, we put out a research report that suggests that by 2075, uh, China and India, uh, perhaps in reverse order, in fact, will be the two largest economies in the world. Uh, we're seeing population growth in certain countries. We're seeing population stagnation uh, in others, such as China. And of course, we know this uh, very well in Japan and also in the UK. And so I just think that it's a very, very interesting time. If you look at these kind of traditional superpowers, perhaps those that have benefited from uh, that era of hyper-globalization, if we kind of look at where they are in the world um, and how they benefited and how they're trying to preserve their status, um, I think that we're in for a very interesting uh, next couple of decades. So, so, you know, that's that's what I would say is where we are, um, you know, what we do about all of that, because I think that there will be a nonlinear path here. I mean, that I don't have answers for in particular, but I actually do think if one were to be objective and dispassionate, it's going to be a much more interesting time, perhaps, than 
uh, the previous uh, period has been where essentially, you know, barring a couple of blips such as the internet, um, the internet bubble bursting, the financial crisis, of course, which was probably more than a blip in 2008, and then certain natural disasters and otherwise, I think that this is just going to be a very, very different period. Uh, and living in this part of the world, uh, you know, with my proximity to China, I find that fascinating. You know, how the countries in this part of the world react to a stronger China, what does that mean for Japan? Will it remilitarize the, the, the uh, relationship between South Korea, North Korea, the relationship between all of these countries and the US? And then, of course, you know, uh, how the, the kind of construct, if you will, or the paradigm uh, as it relates to China and Taiwan plays out. Uh, this is going to be a fascinating period to observe uh, in the coming years. So that was a little bit of a ramble. Hopefully, at a minimum, you don't think that bankers are the most boring people in the world. Uh, and to the extent that you have any reactions or questions, then I'd be very happy to take them. Fantastic, Ian. Thank you so much for this passionate uh, talk. Uh, before we go to questions, can I introduce you my brother, Roland? He's, uh, I've asked him also to come along, Roland. Uh, Roland, is, he's a heart surgeon and he's actually quite close to you. He builds, uh, he, he's done about 8,000 heart operations, but he also builds hospitals and he has built, I think, 10 already and uh, two in China. And the latest hospital he's building is in Guangzhou, which is, I think, quite close to where you are. Yeah. So Roland, uh, he can- Very nice to meet you. Roland? Hello? Roland? Yeah, he always has some trouble with the internet in China. So Roland? Oh yeah, I think he, let's give him a moment. Yeah, he doesn't. Maybe he can talk later. So if there are any other questions, maybe um, um, maybe you, Ichiro, maybe you have a question. I think you are kind of closest to Ian, so you must have uh, interesting questions to ask or to discuss. Well, I mean, thank you, Ian, and thank you, Gerhard. Um, Ian, it's jolly good to, good to see you. I don't know how many years it's been. Um, so the, the appellation that I am the closest to you in relative terms, <laughs> maybe true, but we haven't seen each other for a really true. long time. But I can say, uh, Gerhard, that Ian was a superstar amongst the uh, junior analysts in, in our team, not just in our team, but across the board in at SG Warburg, SBC Warburg. And uh, it is no surprise that he's ascended to those heights in the intervening years. Uh, and um, I'm very pleased that he's doing so well. Now, <clears throat> I guess I have, I mean, I've got a number of questions I'd like to ask. I mean, I'm, I just throw, this, throw some of the topics mm. out. One is the, one is the, uh, and Gerhard alluded to this at the beginning, the, the ascent or the, the, the sort of um, uh, the, how uh, minorities do in financial services in general, and particularly in those economies where, you know, it's it's financial services have been dominated and continues to be dominated by by the majority, um, and that that could be Japan, you know, it could be other markets, but most strikingly in the United States and and the United Kingdom. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of um, uh, climate change. I'd, I'd quite like to hear what what Goldman Sachs are doing, uh, particularly in your region, um, in the S South Asia region, uh, East Asia, South Asia, what it is that Goldman Sachs are doing to mitigate the effects of climate change um, and what your thoughts are on the role of investment banks in promoting, promoting uh, um, climate change uh, policies and measures. Um, I, I mean, I've got lots more, but I guess uh, those are the two that stand out in my mind. So I'll stop there. Okay. I, I feel much more uh, able to speak thoughtfully on the former question. So we'll start there. Um, so first of all, you know, how do we define minorities? So there's gender, 
diversity and then of course there's ethnic diversity and otherwise um i would say that uh gender diversity has made probably the most progress uh across the financial services industry just by virtue of the fact of course that half of the population uh is female now there has to be a lot of kind of purposeful nurturing of talent but as i look across the industry today and think back to my analyst period where uh and Yuritra will probably remember this well we had very few uh females in positions of authority um and i kind of start there because i think you know it's one thing to be able to attract uh diversity to investment banks but to me the real test of the success of diversity and, and that's not just exclusively in investment banks is are there ultimately people in positions of authority who uh represent diversity be that gender or ethnic um and i think if you were to look today i mean you don't have to look any further than city with jane fraser as ceo uh, to see that women now have made it all the way to the top. And I, I would fully expect that there will be a number of women in the C-suites of financial services firms. I mean, there already are, but there will be an increasing number in years to come. When it comes to ethnic diversity, of course, that's a very broad statement because I think different ethnicities perhaps do better than others. But what I believe we still haven't seen that much of. Uh, there are obviously some instances, some examples, um, is uh, seeing representation, ethnically diverse representation at the helm of decision making of a number of organisations. Now, if I was just to, to look at Goldman Sachs, because obviously that's the organisation that I know the best, you know, the most senior uh, rank at Goldman Sachs is partner, um, and we have, you know, over 400 partners in a out of a total population of uh, well over 40,000 people. And so we kind of say broad, broad brush that one percent of the population, you know, kind of makes it to partner over time. Um, and if I kind of look at the black partners there, um, I think that the firm has made tremendous strides in the last few years, but from a very, very small base where, you know, we had. At one point in time, if we were to look a few cycles ago, there were probably seven or eight partners. And now, since we just had a partner offsite uh, in the US last week, uh, there are 17. So, you know, it, it's obviously, it's it's baby steps. But I think that, you know, for people coming into organizations to see uh, people who look like them in those positions. So if you're a, a Black uh, graduate that's looking to, work in, in financial services, and then you see that there are 17 partners at Goldman Sachs, and, you know, equally, whether it's, a, you know, the other firms, uh, uh, UBS, Citi, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Bank of America, etc. I think that that is the single best advertisement, um, because if you see people who look like you, you think that you can do it as well. And, you know, it doesn't need to be black, it can be Asian, it can be uh, gender, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's a long-winded answer to your question, Yuichiro, but I would I would probably say, if to say it succinctly, uh, I think that it is improving in leaps and bounds simply because there is a lot of focus on minority representation. Uh, I think that that's come about against the backdrop of the Me Too movement, uh, against the backdrop of Black Lives Matter, against the backdrop of um, Asian hate, uh, in America, because of course these issues I think are most pronounced in the United States. Um, I, I'm sure I would get in trouble for saying this. I, I've always found the UK much uh, easier to navigate, but maybe that's because I'm from the UK. Um, and I think perhaps unfortunately, but it's worth saying here, you know, if you are fortunate enough to go to the best universities, and I would include Cambridge uh, in that category, I do think that certainly in the UK, society has a kind of, I don't know if I'd call it cognitive bias, but they do have a bias. And I think, you know, regardless of your background, regardless of your gender, your your religious uh, uh, beliefs, regardless of your ethnicity, you know, to a certain extent, you are credentialized 
by uh, your places of education. And, you know, that's why I believe that in order to increase minority representation in financial services, actually what we have to be doing is increasing minority representation in our best universities. Uh, and that's another reason why I'm particularly uh, keen, if you will, to continue the work that we're doing for Cambridge along the lines of uh, this Get in Cambridge uh, initiative, which is one of many, but the one that I'm personally uh, most involved in. Uh, can I uh, come in uh, with one point? Sure. You mentioned these different uh, types of diversity, you know, uh, gender <clears throat> and, and, you know, whatever you call it, color of the yeah. skin or whatever you call it, origin, you know. There's another type of diversity, which is neurodiversity, you know, mm -hmm. which concerns, for example, autism. Yeah. And uh, we had a talk here by Sir Simon ba Baron Cohen, who you may know. He is uh, one of the top global ex uh, researchers and also campaigners and also community activists on um, bringing, uh, making, uh, how do you say, enriching both society and also the lives yeah. or in families of people who have autism. If yeah. you can, if you like, I can put you in touch with Sir Baron Cohen. You forgot. So I'm sorry to bring that in, you know, because no, no, neurodiversity is often forgotten. And as you know, you know, some of the top mathematicians and some of the top people in, in many very, especially very kind of uh, um, uh, number intensive uh, fields, you know, which might include investment banking are autism, you know, and they often have a much more difficult life, you know. Yes. I, so I think that you make a very, very good point. Uh, and, you know, my apologies for not <clears throat> including that in the definition that I gave. You know, I think one of the things and, you know, respect that in each organization there are there are laws around sharing of information, what information you want to share. And why do I mention that? I mention it because, you know, in Goldman Sachs, for example, we uh have a thing where you can kind of like state what your whether it's your uh, ethnic background what ethnic group you belong to uh etc cetera, etc cetera. um i'm sure you know what religious beliefs or otherwise um where you're able to kind of self-identification if you will and so the question is um because we have some very brilliant very brilliant people who i i wouldn't be surprised if they were somewhere along the spectrum because I totally agree with you. Everybody is somewhere along the spectrum. Yeah, for sure. But, but you know, when it relates to creativity or brilliance in numbers, then they may be further along the spectrum than, than otherwise. But equally, I would say that is not, when I say it's not talked about, I don't mean in a, in a negative sense, but it's not disclosed because it's up to the individual to disclose uh, that about themselves. And so, you know, I think that society probably has some way to go in terms of creating safe spaces, creating a comfortable environment where people feel uh, empowered to be able to talk about uh, diversity, including neurodiversity, and for it to be uh, for it to be accepted. It's not to say it isn't, but I think it's un it, it's not widely publicized. But I think that the fundamental point that you make uh, around neurodiversity and how much value can be added is spot on. I completely uh, agree with that. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you. Uh, I just jump in and uh, I hope my brother's computer works so that I can introduce uh, Roland. Roland, does it work? Uh, hello? I think it works. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. No, hello. I want to introduce myself. I'm the younger brother of Gerhard. And, and I just didn't uh, learn something as uh, how sophisticated as my brother Gerhard. So I only became a cardiac surgeon. So, and very, very illustrious. Uh... A very illustrious family indeed. Um, all right. So... But not only cardiac surgeon, he builds hospitals, you know, he, so he does, yeah. a, he builds a whole... In, you're based in Guangzhou, yes. I hear. I'm currently in Guangzhou, that's correct. So it's actually, you're based in Hong Kong. I will be actually this weekend, I pro probably will be in Hong Kong actually for a day or so this weekend. Okay, well, I will, uh, I think Gerhard has my details, so... You know, yeah. I'm sure at some stage we'll be able to meet in person. Yeah. 
I'll put you <laughs> in touch. Right. So all three of us, let's meet up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. It's not to organize, but okay. Ah, uh, yeah, great. Uh, I didn't answer Yitro's second question, so maybe yeah, I should right. just touch Please on that. And, yeah. uh, it'll be a much shorter answer. So, you know, does Goldman Sachs, uh, what do we think of climate change? Do we support ESG? The short answer is yes. We've made a public commitment from memory uh, over time to commit, uh, I think, $750 billion to, uh, to uh, climate change. Uh, we have teams dedicated to it. We have funds dedicated to it. I will send you, Yutro, if uh, I'll connect you with you on LinkedIn. But we have some very interesting research uh, that we've put out on the climate uh, problem, on carbonomics, on moving to uh, to carbon neutral environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we do give a lot of attention to it. We do give a lot of attention to it as an institution in this part of the world. Am I yeah. in the weeds on all that we're doing? No, but I do believe that I can probably share some stuff with you uh, and then we can develop a conversation from there. That's great. Thank you. That's great. Okay, Tetsuya, I think you, you wanted to ask something. Tetsuya? Yeah, I have two questions. Yep. One is that you mentioned that you in Cambridge, you learn how to think and how to uh, reach to the answer, whatever yes. the question you asked. Yes. Now, my question is that you worked in SBC Warburg, Salomon, mm -hmm. Nico, Goldman Sachs, and now um, you know, you're working in some community work as well. And what is your learning in each institution? For instance, in my case, you know, when I joined McKinsey, I learned how to think logically. So yep. logical thinking was uh, my biggest learning. When I joined JP Morgan, I worked in one of the projects, which was to give advice to one of the uh, satellite communica telecommunication companies. All of them went bankrupt, you know, after we gave an advice because we missed out the <laughs> the development of the terrestrial mobile communications. Yeah. So what I learned there is that uh, you define competition. If you define competition too narrowly, then you know you miss the big big wave. Now you know facing these uh, COVID nineteen very disruptive uh, time. You know I mean what are your your you know learnings so far, and then with that learning how. Again, you know, you already mentioned some of the aspect of uh, what's going on in your mind, but if you could uh, use your your learnings experience, how do you analyze the current situation, particularly, you know, narrowing down to the finance financial world? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just taking notes as I hear you uh, as I hear you speak. So, I would say very briefly at Warburg, I think I learned, uh, so I learned how to think independently at Cambridge. I learned how to think logically slash rationally uh, at Warburg uh, because it was very much a uh, an apprenticeship based culture as I was starting out. So I learned the building blocks of finance. Mm -hmm. At Nico Solomon, I learned how to think across cultures. Uh, obviously, my Japanese improved dramatically, but I was really working in a domestic Japanese environment. Uh, and at Goldman Sachs, I think I've learned to pull all of those things together and deliver an institution and the power of that institution um, to deliver a holistic solution, if you will, which sound, kind of sounds a little bit glib to put it that, that way. But, you know, I, I do believe that I can, if I have a client that has needs, I can evaluate those needs together with my my colleagues because we are very team oriented uh, and I would never claim to be I'm an expert in anything, actually. But what I can do is I know exactly how to pull my organization together to deliver for a client. So if I if I think about all of that, and what that means packaged together, because you mentioned COVID, um, yeah. You know, I think actually that this uh, this transaction that I mentioned, the support of uh, Cathay Pacific, the financial support where we worked with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, you know, that gave me uh, that was a, a, a microcosm, if you will, or a synthesis of all of these points that I've just made. Right. You had to analyze quite rationally 
uh, a, a financial challenge because the airlines were under severe pressure. And so there's a lot of analysis around cash flow, how long, how, how you know, your cash generated capability, given that uh, your, you know, your capacity has dropped by over 90 percent, routes have been shut down. Uh, planes have been grounded, et cetera, et cetera. So there is the kind of the logical financial analysis component. At the same time, you're clearly working across cultures because uh, this is Hong Kong, but with an ax to China. If you kind of think about the shareholder base, uh, there's, you know, there are a number of stakeholders, but including sovereigns, including uh, uh, other airlines in China, including uh, conglomerates in Hong Kong. You're working with the government and you're working to protect, to support Hong Kong, to help to help that, you know, one of the flagship organizations, one of the emblems of Hong Kong society sustain itself through a very, very dark period. And now uh, together with the rest of the world, but arguably, you know, Hong Kong, China um, have been a little bit longer in coming out of, out of COVID. So the issues therefore, the challenges have been prolonged. Um, and so if I kind of think about it in that way, um, you know, that would probably be a great example of how, you know, not not through any design, but if I can kind of look back and I, I really do thank you for the question because I've never had to think about it in this sense, but it really did bring together everything that I learned uh, throughout my career because there was hardcore corporate finance, but there were also intense client management skills, working across cultures, thinking about the optics of a solution and ultimately how, you know, if you were to be play devil's advocate, what are the negatives of everything that we're proposing? Again, it wasn't just Goldman Sachs. There were other banks involved. There were multiple stakeholders. Um, but I do think um, that despite the rivalry that we have between various financial institutions, this was a great example where everyone put ego aside because we wanted to help Hong Kong. And, you know, as I kind of think about that in the context of my overall career, it's probably one of my proudest moments, um, just because I think that we did some good uh, at the same time, of course, uh, that we were doing, you know, from other people's perspectives, yet another deal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes. It's a very, very impressive way you answered my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I add one more very short question. Of course. Uh, you say that your clients are financial, I mean, private equities. Yes. Now, I moved from investment banking to private equity myself. Yeah. Weren't you tempted to change your career and <laughs> do the private equity? Uh, there have been several times uh, during my career that I have thought about uh yeah. private equity because obviously my client base uh is private equity and i have received a number of invitations to join mm -hmm. them um you know i would say maybe two things one is i feel i i very much enjoy what i do um and you know to the extent that my career can can be extended from here i would expect that i will continue to enjoy uh what i can do and obviously i have my own ambitions i think the other thing is you know, just because one is a good banker doesn't necessarily mean that one can be a great investor. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I were to kind of do things all again, would I have potentially been interested in exploring private equity, you know, coming directly out of out of uh, university? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I do wonder, uh, you know, there are certain people who do make the move as a senior banker and they do very, very well. Lifespan for private equities, you know, is really from start to finish is 10 years. And so, you know, at this stage, do I want to, to do that and take the risk? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, there are certainly, I would never say no, because it is the most logical thing for me to do after banking. But equally, you know, at one point uh, in the future, I might well want to go back into academia. So we shall see. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think uh, Cambridge colleges have uh, are always looking for good masters, uh, especially <laughs> from, with uh, good um, fa financial, how do you say, ability to attract uh, funding. Uh, so I, Sune, I'm very sorry, Sune. I, I think you wanted to have a question. Is that right, Sune? Hello? Uh, hi. Uh, hi, I think you had a question, no? Yes, hi and sorry, and there's a bit of you background. Have a camera if you go but, uh, see you, then it's a bit nicer. 
sure. Okay, Hi great. There. Good, good. So um, in my experience, I mean, a lot of success uh, in the financial field is predicated on good luck. Um, so I was just wondering the extent to which you have to grapple with that and how you'd, what advice you'd offer to anyone who's navigating sort of periods of bad luck within their career, particularly in the financial field, which is very much sort of being in the right place at the right time. Thank you. Um, so you mean this on a personal level, is that correct? Uh, so yeah, it's a bad luck within your career, essentially. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, I think for all of us, myself included, uh, my career has been non-linear. I mean, I can give you the narrative as I gave, you know, earlier on, because <laughs> we always manipulate narratives to our own ends, right? Uh, there have been some very dark moments, um, for sure. There were times, uh, particularly at the start, where I was working six and a half days a week. Uh, you know, I'd literally, if you if you live in London, you'd wake up in the winter months, you'd go to work and it was dark, and you'd come home and it was dark, and you'd only see daylight on a Sunday afternoon. And you do kind of ask yourself, okay, does this make sense? There are mistakes that you make in analysis that can get sent to clients. Uh, you wonder about that. You, you know, there have been times early on in my career where, um, you know, I kind of sat there and I thought, you know, I looked around and I thought that maybe other people were moving more quickly uh, than I myself was. We've had uh, financial crises where there were layoffs and you kind of always wonder, are you going to be subject to that? Because actually, in in very few cases, is it because uh, the, the the colleagues that do lose the jobs are not good at what they do? Uh, you know, some of these these decisions are un very unfortunately, you know, kind of the the when I say top down, that's not to to blame uh, senior management, but it's kind of like we'll start with we need to resize our organization according to the commercial opportunity that presents itself uh, and then you analyze which businesses are commercially more important at any one point in time and that is it's a mark to market as opposed to a long-term view but remember for most uh, organizations they're public and they answer to shareholders and therefore there is short-term pressure to deliver results and so you know with that as background I think that and this is very easy to say, I won't say that I'm the best at doing it, but depersonalizing and realizing that it's it's not uh, it's not always you and you can be a victim of circumstance. I would say that's one thing. For me, I actually worry when things go too well um, because I think that pride comes before a fall. Uh, and so I am by nature quite a paranoid person. Um, and I'm going to be delivering a town hall to our people on Friday. So, you know, spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about some of this stuff as well. But, you know, when when we feel that we're on top, we should always remember that there are people looking, as as one of my heroes, Sir Alex Ferguson, would say to uh, to, to we, you know, the people who want to knock you off your perch. Right. That's what he did with Liverpool every day. I wake up and that's what I expect, uh, you know, our friendly competitors want to do with us and so I force myself even when uh, things are going well to analyze our business to think about uh, are we doing all that we can do for our clients are we giving our people the right opportunities to you know to kind of stretch themselves to give them uh, runway so that they can elevate in the organization as well and you know you, you could say that a byproduct of that is uh, that you never entirely relax. And I'd probably say that's true. But I guess it's a very long winded and perhaps inarticulate way of saying outside of the stuff that I said around be being a victim of circumstance. Um, I do think that even in difficult times, just being consistent and thinking about how you can improve yourself, not just thinking, but doing stuff about it, because I firmly believe that hard work in life will be rewarded and so all I would say to anyone is, you know, this too shall come to pass. If this is something you like doing, you keep pushing yourself, um, you build your network, because a lot of this does ultimately kind of revolve around how connected you are into organizations, who you know you may have worked with in the past, and opportunities come literally out of left field as you know, I think, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier on, the stuff that you do for people uh, that was not necessarily 
de deliberate because you thought that you were going to benefit. And yet the biggest commercial success in my career came from absolutely nothing. I could never have planned it. But, you know, this person said you were a good person to me. And so, you know, as much of a, of a cutthroat industry as this perhaps appears, you know, always try to retain your humility, um, always try to retain your uh, integrity, uh, try to retain your dignity, meaning that there's no one else who's any better than you. And that's kind of my, my life code, if you will. I always kind of live by this dignity, humility, integrity. And that's what keeps me going. I'm not saying that that works for everyone, but you kind of figure out what your values are. You stay consistent to your values. You work hard. There'll be bumps in the road for sure. But over time, I'm convinced that things will work out. Very helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think uh, Ryan, uh, did you want to ask something? Ryan, hello? Yes. Hello. Yes, Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ian. Um, as someone who's just starting off uh, my career in London, albeit in law rather than finance, um, that was very inspiring. Um, I, I guess sort of um, touch on a different aspect to your previous answer. Um, from your sort of career story, it sounds like there were sort of certain points and certain decisions that you had to make. So, for example, um, the move to Japan, the move to China, um, joining Goldman Sachs. And I was quite curious as to, um, at those kind of critical moments, was there a particular decision framework or sort of um, a process that you went through um, before kind of deciding to make that move? Uh, um, it's, so, it so quite well. I, I will give you the, the scientific answer and then I'll give you the honest answer. You know, my, I, I, my, my decision to move to China, that was driven by my parents purely. So I can't take any credit for that. And that really was pivotal in the overall direction of my life. Um, everything else, I, the way I do things is I kind of I'll test myself like I'll wake up how do I feel every day for a week when I wake up how how do I feel in my heart is this the right decision yes or no if it kind of feels the right decision then I'll superimpose some rational framework to justify why it was the right decision but I do think in my case at least that the best decisions are made in my heart and not my, my head and so I retrofit it with some sort of logic to justify post uh, post decision if you will. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, that means think with your guts, I guess. Yes. Or your heart. Right? Yes. Uh, Ian, I think uh, we are almost everybody. I think everybody had a chance. Now, if there are any more questions, here's your last chance before we let uh, Ian probably join his family. Now it's uh, earlier in Hong Kong than in Tokyo, but still, I think you, uh, you, uh, uh, it's getting quite late also for you now. Ian, thank you so yeah. very, very much. Uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and, you know, I, I look forward to rekindling old friendships with you, Ichiro, and getting to know others yeah. of you going forward. So Gerhardt has uh, my contact details to the extent that anyone would like to be in touch. And I look forward to uh, seeing you all in due course. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank I look forward to thank seeing you, you again. Thanks. Thank bye, you. Bye. 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 Bye.